Welcome. With me today is our Dan Cardokas from the Colorado Cross Disabilities Coalition and Benedicia. And we wanted to discuss today people with disabilities, but specifically in relation to what I frequently call the rites of passage, the mile markers in life, you know, things like birth, having kids, getting married, um, the funerals when they occur. We were talking uh, a while back, and maybe to get the ball rolling here, you mentioned an experience your brother had, uh, Benedicia. Well, there were several. Which one are you referring to in well, specific? Well, you mentioned um, he was engaged to be married. Oh, that. Yes. Actually, he and his girlfriend considered themselves engaged. Okay. But both sets of parents were absolutely against it, not because they thought the children were incompatible, but because the children were disabled. And disabled children, of course, are not allowed to grow up, and they are not allowed to marry, and they are not allowed to have children. As a matter of fact, there was a movie on that just a couple of nights ago hmm. where they were talking about a case um, somewhat earlier this century where there was a young lady that was in an institution, and her mother went to court and had her sterilized hmm. so that there would be no consequences when she was assaulted by the people in the institution. Um, that whole issue to me is, is really wrong anyway because you can't stop people from growing up. Even the people who are by the, the medical community considered to be of a certain mental chronological age, that doesn't mean that they don't physically grow up. It doesn't mean that there won't be consequences of that. And if you ignore it and deny it, you are only going to make things worse. Even if their mental capacities were diminished, the sterilization of another human being to me is absolutely inhumane. I mean, it's just not... You're like, not addressing the problem, you're addressing the consequences. Mm -hmm. If she was in an institution where she was being assaulted, then the real problem was not whether or not there were consequences, but the fact that there were people allowed to work in an institution like that who were not kicked out on their butts and taken to court. But even it's more still basic, rape. Exactly, but even more basic than that to me, you're not treating them like a human being anymore. No, you're not. You're treating them like a dog or a cat that gets fixed because you don't want to have to deal with puppies and kittens. And to me, there has got to be a certain dignity inherent in being a human being. Mm -hmm. that I think you just—I mean, to me, it's—it's—it's it's, it's only a difference of degrees. I think between deciding to sterilize someone and deciding in favor of euthanasia, without even consulting that person, sure. regardless of their mm -hmm. capacity. Um, when I first uh, was working with. Uh, persons with developing dis disabilities. And I was in a, kind of like in between state school and community living, I was helping train them. And there was one couple that I was so thrilled that they were put into our community, in our uh, facility together. And she was about, oh, 72, and he was about 56. And both of them were very close and you could tell that they loved each other and they took care of each other. And Ollie was talking to me one time and she says, listen, I want to tell you something. Uh, uh, Jesse and I have as much love and commitment as any married couple that is working in this place. And it really made me stop thinking. It's true, it was true. They loved each other and whenever uh, Ollie happened to pass away. Jesse was allowed to grieve because it was his spouse, his mate was gone. And we were talking about that. People, people with disabilities aren't even allowed to grieve losses. You know, you're not supposed to grieve losses. And with disabilities, they will either put you up on a pedestal 
saying how great you're handling this loss or this change in your uh, life. Which they have all the best intentions when they say that, but I, I think we both recognize that they don't realize what they're saying. But on the other hand, if a person is really grieving that loss and is having a hard time with that, say for instance it's a person that is very active within sports, swimming and skiing and everything else and has a spinal injury, loses all of what they used to be able to do, mm -hmm. so there is a lot of grieving, then they come around and they say, what's wrong with you? I, was, I had that experience. I was going through post-traumatic stress from the accident. And I'd been home for about two months. And we had a new pastor. And all the people started going to the pastor and says, what's wrong with Dan? He's so depressed. You know, oh, he shouldn't be right. depressed, <laughs> you know. And here, all of a sudden, I was used to working 60 hours a week, and I was down to nothing. I was no longer providing for my family. I couldn't even remember enough to check my daughter to keep her when she was asleep to make sure she didn't mess in the crib. You know, basic things that I could not handle anymore. And then they told me that I didn't have the right to grieve. They, I didn't have the right to be depressed because after all, it happened three months ago. You should be over it by now. And if you just decide that you are going to get on with it. That will just make everything all better again. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. My parents even came to me and said, well, just as, Dan, you'll be all right just when you finally decide that you're no longer disabled. And I was saying, excuse me? How can you stop from being disabled? Once you're disabled, it's a permanent condition. I suppose it's the old problem of if you don't think of yourself as disabled, then um, you won't keep seeing things as obstacles. You will see them as, I hate the phrase, challenges. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what you know. <laughs> people, people use that word with the best of intentions, but in reality it is so very patronizing. Yes, but you know what the road to hell is paved with. Yes, with good intentions. I've said that yes. on the show before. <laughs> yes. uh, and I've heard it forever. But yeah, uh, but that's where I feel a need to educate these people. And it's I, I, it's I not even it's not even a matter of education because everybody approaches disabilities mm -hmm. in their own way. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, the reason they have problems with disabilities is because somewhere inside of them where they can't even verbalize it, they are deathly afraid that disabilities are contagious. Mm -hmm. Think about that. <laughs> but I think in reference to working with a person who uh, either is disabled or has recently become disabled, you need to stop and instead of either being patronizing or denying, let them take the lead. But there's another key to that that I think that people don't realize too. When you become disabled, you're going to carry all of the baggage that you had before. Mm -hmm. Being disabled, disabled does not change you. It enhances the problems you had before. Makes them more and obvious. It may, well, what happens is if you are taught as a child to not stare at that person with disabilities, mm -hmm. or we, we ought to have a, suggest that Mary get put in an institution, and you build that child, teaching that child that there's something wrong with disabilities. And then all of a sudden, something happens to that person and they become disabled. They become, quote, less than a human being. Mm -hmm. It's then, a contagion issue. Then, you know, disabilities, I used to say the reason why disabilities was so hard to understand is because it could happen to any person, any time, any place, regard, uh, regardless of race, creed, or sex. But getting back to, to our subject, I guess, um, oh, for lack of a better word, forgive me, in, in pursuit of a normal life, um, to me, it doesn't make any sense that just because uh, you have one disability or another, I tend to think in some way everyone is disabled in some way or another. Um, 
there's these rites of passage, things that bring a sense of wholeness to life in their best form, I think. Things like marriage, like being able to have kids. But you see, there's another thing, and Jeannie and I were talking about this earlier. You, uh, what does that mean? You, as a human being, learn from failure. Mm -hmm. Whenever you have problems, persons with disabilities don't normally get the right to fail. They are always said, you know, always kept from trying out new things because you just might fail. I had doctors that told me that. And I know that you've had the same people tell yeah. you the same thing. Oh, yeah. Don't do things, don't attempt anything because you just might fail and you don't want to fail. You don't want to be you've disabled got, and fail. You've already got enough problems without having to deal with failure too. Only in this case, the <laughs> failure we're talking about is the failure of a marriage, the failure of a parenting Challenges. experience. I mean, it's it's it's, it's something no different, simple. but it is different because it's a it's it's just a, a higher degree of the same, I guess. What about a job? Why try to do a job because you might fail in that job? Mm -hmm. Very basic things. Don't try to live off as, social security. You know. I I understand. I'm just trying <laughs> for for this specific discussion. I'm just trying to see if we can focus on familiar relationships and the kinds of mile markers in life that are not dependent upon specific geography or specific employment. Well, well a good, good case in point, and I, I see what you're saying, a good case in point is I believe that as a child grows up, if that child is disabled growing up, mm -hmm. the tendency is that the parents decide, well, we've got to keep them at home until we die. And they never well, think about what happens after that. Right. And then they don't. Or if they, they do set something up, it's something that this would not necessarily be in the child's best interest, but they have been kept limited through mm -hmm. so much of their lives, they can't handle anything more than that. Mm. And so whenever they get to the normal milestones, my personal belief is let that child go away. Let that child be as much as that child can be. And let the child do the exploring of the limits. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, one of the things that I see, I'm, I'm sorry this is going to offend a lot of people. I have had a real problem with the Special Olympics ever since I mm -hmm. heard about them. Mm -hmm. I think they started out with a great idea. Mm -hmm. But I find it something that really makes me wince when they brag about the fact that everybody who's in the Special Olympics gets a ribbon. What's the point? You might as well have them show up, parade them across the stage, and hand them a ribbon as they came off. It's mm -hmm. just as meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the kids are not going to be allowed to compete in the true sense of the word, then they are not going to understand what the real world is all about, and they are not going to be able to deal with it when they're stuck getting out there. I would disagree only in the sense of when I first thought about becoming Sister Who, I was a competitor at the 1990 International Gay Games in Vancouver. Everyone who competed got a medal. And I was very proud of that, and I didn't feel that it was just handed to me just because I happened to be there. But it was something to recognize that even though I didn't turn out to be one of the top three or top ten or whatever it was, um, I have no way of knowing, there was something to reward me for having pushed myself to go through so many exercises that I absolutely loathed the sight of a weight machine. Um, there was no way they could have known that. But to me, it meant something that after applying myself with that kind of discipline, there was something that I had to show for it. Sure. But there's a difference between receiving something because you were there. You know, to a certain extent, that's a souvenir. That's different. Mm -hmm. But when they, when they set up something that is technically a competition, 
and then refuse to do any sort of a ranking because they're afraid they might hurt the feelings of the people who entered. So you're saying... Then it's not a competition and they don't learn anything about what it means to push yourself as hard as you can. So the difference between, just for this specific example, and then we'll move on, uh, the difference you're saying, and forgive my ignorance about the Special Olympics, is that they don't actually have a first, second, and third place. Everybody See, in our gets case, the they same did. thing. Yeah. They, they had you know, the silver, gold, and bronze medals, but then for everybody else, you yeah. still didn't go home with yeah. nothing. Well, it's, like, it's like dog shows or, or anything else like that. Everybody who comes to the show gets something that says, I was there. Mm -hmm. That's got nothing to do with the competition Everybody itself. Everybody gets a ribbon, yeah. whether it's first, you know, and there's yeah. nothing to distinguish well, the prizes. Not to dwell on it, because yeah. Yeah, you know, but that's that. That is part of the whole point because mm -hmm. people have gotten into this mindset that you must protect handicapped people from the real world. If you protect them, they are not going to be able to live in it when they're stuck doing so. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be. It's not just that they will fail; it's they're going to fall flat on their faces and they're not going to be able to get up because they don't know how. They've never done it before. That is unkind. That's like sending your kids off to college and they don't know how to run their laundry and cook a meal. Mm -hmm. The question comes up in my mind, and I, I don't mean to be unkind, I hope this is an unkind question, but it, whether there should be a separate Olympics for disabled people. That's where we have a, a I, we, I have a feeling that, like this last year when they had Olympics, Olympics, they had wheelchair Olympics. And if you see the basketball wheelchair co competition, it's exciting mm -hmm. because it is actual competition. I would defy any person who could walk trying to get into a wheelchair and bounce a basketball and make baskets. It's meaningful. It's that a regular way. regulation court. Yeah, it's, yeah. And, and they had it, they had specific events within the, uh, Olympics for persons with disabilities. That I feel is better than the special quote Special but, Olympics. But even though there are events within the Olympics specifically for people with certain disabilities, mm -hmm. the standards of the way the game is played or what have you are not any different. Right. So that's what I'm wondering about because there's, you know, th it's a far stretch because there was a whole lot more involved in apartheid, but there's a certain sense in which I look at different social structures like that, and it seems to me to be a smaller version of a social form of apartheid. Well, you know, the, the separateness that you are here and we are here, and you do your things and we do our things, and, and even if we're doing not, the same thing, we don't mix them. You are not good enough to yeah. be with us. Yeah, the only the only thing I have some I think is good with Special Olympics is like I worked with profoundly developmentally disabled severely. Mm -hmm. handicap and that's where I thought it was very meaningful however I right again I worked with teenagers and adults that mm -hmm. had a mentality of six months to a year and a half one mother did not see her son for seven years mm -hmm. and the reason why was that the doctors told her that her son was going to be dead at the age of 12 I don't and think anybody has any business making that kind of prediction. And she was afraid to come in because she felt like every time that she looked at him, she would see somebody dying. Here he was, 17 years old. Nobody took any, he it was a bulimic. They'd put him out in the hall and just let him waller in that after the meal time. And the second day I was working with him, he stopped. And within a year and a half, mentally he had grown three months. And mm. the mother came and she says, I'm amazed at, because I decided I was going to treat Tommy just as any other boy. And I talked to him just as any boy. And he accepted that and he accepted my discipline. He also accepted my love and he outdid himself. Once he was allowed to try things, one time he put his hand up to the uh, glass and I just instinctively took it away. He started drinking from a cup by himself. Mm -hmm. He initiated the whole process. But so many people had said, oh, Tommy can't do anything. He's bulimic. He 
Waller's in his vomit and everything else, let's not take care of him. You know, let's not treat him like a human being. Mm -hmm. My youngest brother was when he was born. We were told in the first place, he would probably never come home from the hospital. Mm -hmm. In the second place, if he ever did come home from the hospital, um, he was so profoundly retarded that there would be no um, possibility of him being anything but you know, mentally a vegetable. I mean, we aren't even talking chronological age. We are talking no upper, higher men mental activities whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The kid's in college. Granted, he's a few years later, but that's another issue. Um, yeah, but, th but this is the triumph <laughs> of life that I love to celebrate. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the thing is, he would never have done well at this if he hadn't all the time had to come up against things where nobody was going to catch him if he fell. And I'm not just talking physically, I'm talking about when he would come up to something that he wanted to try out, nobody was going to hold his hand. If he wanted to try it, he had to do it on his own just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, to the extent that everybody else had to. And here's a kid that was told he's going to be vegetable, he will never see well enough to be able to learn to read, and so, I mean, lists of things that he, sh he will never be able to do. And the kid is turning out these exquisite oil paintings. He just learned last year. Wow. But see, again, here's a kid. He's almost 30 years old now. He is doing the kinds of things now, because he's finally being allowed to, the kinds of things that those of us with more, more average upbringings, mm -hmm. we would have been playing with this stuff when we were in junior high school at the latest. And there's probably no reason he couldn't have been before. Right. Just that nobody offered them to him? Sure, because he's not capable. We already know this. Mm -hmm. We haven't tried. We haven't yes. asked him if yes, he yes, wants yes. to. It's impossible. It's impossible. I'm tired of hearing that. Uh, no, no, no. Um, no. It's not impossible. impossible. It's not possible for him. Well, that's so what I we mean. are not going to put him through the agony of having him fail. It's not agony. I mean, how difficult is it for you to pick up something for the first time and realize that you can't be Rembrandt today? Yeah. So... Even if it was agony, though, I don't think anyone should be spared the agony that everyone else has to go through. Because it makes it sweeter when you succeed. Sure. I, I remember one thing when I became, uh, I was starting out as a new vice president of mm -hmm. an independent living center. And I was trying to work with something with Cortez. And people in Durango were kind of like saying, no, you're not going to be able to do anything, you know, hold back and all this other stuff. And I was talking to Joan Rodefeld, who was the, was the state um, independent living specialist. And she made this statement. She says, Dan, I want to tell you, you have wings so you can fly. And I started See, and that's the real point to me. Everyone has a right, whether it's agony or whether it's pleasure, everyone has a right to their own life experiences. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing you can do for anybody is limit those experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But to come back to the rites of passage, this is something that retarded people and handicapped people put up with all the time. Why is it so bad, and I'm going to say it, why is it so bad to say that a person in a wheelchair can have a sex life. <laughs> yes, so that's they another can. Episode. We're going to discuss that, but, but that's this another is, episode. This is the kind of thing we're talking about because if you, if you are forbidden to even think about yourself as a sexual person, hmm. you are not going to have a marriage, you are not going to have kids. Here are your two major rites of passage in this lifetime. Each individual has unique ways of seeing and understanding things. Any time an individual, for whatever reason, is not allowed to pass those insights and understandings to another generation, the world, I think, becomes a little more impoverished when that person passes. A little grayer. A little grayer? Yeah. A little less color? Think, think about it. If a full life is all the colors of the rainbow, what happens when you start pulling out little shades? Mm -hmm. Oh, we can't let that person see that. They're, they're handicapped. Well, hopefully, we've encouraged people in a discussion here to leave more of the colors in the rainbow and let the whole thing shine. You know, that we really don't have to worry about it, that we're 
failure is a part of life too. Mm -hmm. And but, can be a very good one. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining me today and sharing all those things. It's been a wonderful little discussion. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.